This week, Stogie Geeks, episode 355. Nelson, Drew, and myself have the opportunity to interview Brad Barco. He's the managing director for Bahama Mama Cigars. Bahama Mamas is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. They got also offices in Las Vegas, Nevada. They're part of the Potomac Tobacco Group. Visit them at BahamaMamaCigar.com. In the second segment, we have Sticks of the Week. Finally, super excited about this. Nelson, Drew, and myself are going to let you know what we've been smoking. It's going to have some commentary, and I am sure that Nelson, the internet sensation soon to be, will have news. Stogie Geeks, episode 355, starts right now. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Josepa, aka Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. So we also have remote Drew, who is remote over in Texas. Look at you, you got some Stogie Geek swag going on in the background. Got my banner. Where are you? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm all set up for the uh, Stogie Geek uh, mobile lounge. Confidence. Confidence isn't walking into a room with your nose in the air, thinking you're better than anyone else. It's walking into a room and not having to compare yourself to anyone in the first place. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the big show. I am your host, Joe Hozempa. This is Stogie Geeks, episode 355. Super excited about this interview. Super excited about Sticks of the Week. Good to be back. Quick programming note next week. Back-to-back interviews. Awesome topics coming up, and then a week after that, got another interview and stick of, sticks of the week. So uh, we got a pretty busy schedule over the next few weeks here at Stogie Geeks. Remember, we keep the conversation going all week long. All you have to do is go to stogiegeeks.com. You can click on those social media links in there. Um, if you want more interaction, you can follow the gentleman to my right, maybe the left on screen. I don't know how that works. Uh, soon to be internet sensation star, oh my God. Mr. Nelson DeMello. Hey, how's everybody doing? Happy Friday. Smoke what you like, like what you smoke. And I am not an internet sensation. I have no idea what he's talking about. He is an internet sensation. Follow me on Instagram, <laughs> Cigar Squad. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's an internet <laughs> sensation. I, I, I have two followers, uh, Drew and Nelson. That's it. Uh, everyone else follows Nelson, which I think is cool, or Drew. Which is good. Email all of your complaints for the show to Drew at StogieGeeks.com. And speaking of the little dockhead kid from Texas, look at you. You're, you're in the cigar. What's up? I am in the cigar. Look at I'm you. I'm back in my elements, and I'm trying to stay here for a long time. So, uh, weather being, you know, last week we or the week, yeah, last week we had snowmageddon. So we were all suffering and freezing and whatnot, except for except for us. Our house had power and water and all the uh natural elements that we need to uh survive that but uh but no i mean not showing off because we because <laughs> we survived that but it, it was a rough week here definitely was a rough week uh but uh here we are in uh 61 degree weather today and no snow on the ground and uh a little bit of rain and that's about it man what's up with you guys well but- before you i we continue i must say that i love it when jews in the Sagaden. Because if you listen back to the show, you always hear birds in the background. Oh, yeah. It's like he's at the <laughs> bird sanctuary over there. It's like, oh, I, well, it's, anyway. I have a natural, <laughs> I have a natural uh, yeah, I do. I have a park right behind me. It's about uh, 45 acres, and it's got all kinds of birds and different migrant fowl and whatnot. So, yeah. Hey, I'm glad <laughs> you guys made it out all right. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Snowmageddon was, sure. was, was pretty crazy for sure. What's going on People with those? What's, yeah, going, yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. What's gonna, going on with you, yeah. Nelson? What's going on? 
just living the dream, working 40, 40 hours a okay. week, five days a week, doing my Stogie Geeks thing, becoming an internet sensation. <laughs> right. I'm gonna have a shirt made. It's gonna be epic. Internet sensation, Nelson the Mellow. There you go. Cool. Yeah. No, I just been rocking and rolling here at the G Unit Studios with Security Weekly. Rocking and rolling. Picked up some new accounts for that. Doing some story geek stuff. So it's it's going well. Everything's everything's kind of cool. The weather's starting to break here too. But we always get duped in April. Everyone gets excited here in New England with March. Oh, we're gonna spring's coming early. I'm like, yeah, right. April is just terrible. But anyway, uh, gentlemen, I want to introduce our interview. Oh, yeah. It is Brad Burko. He's a managing partner for the Bahama Mamas Cigar Company. Uh, Brad, welcome to Stoke Geeks. Welcome to the show, man. Uh, it, it's my pleasure, and uh, like we were saying before we went on the air, I really appreciate the opportunity of coming on your podcast, Stoke Geeks. I've been watching you guys for quite a while, and uh, anytime a, a small boutique brand like ours, Bahama Mama's Company with two cigars, gets an opportunity to come on a, a national show, international show like yours... Uh, we're thrilled. So thank you, gentlemen. Oh, no, no. The pleasure is all ours. And, and, and thank you for your kind words, for sure. Um, let's let's start there. Let's start there. Uh, tell us a little bit about, um, but before we get into how you got into the business and going through your repertoire of tasks that you have accomplished in this fascinating industry, um, let, let's spend some time talking about uh, where you currently are as the managing director, uh, what what some of the responsibilities are, and take us through your plans. Well, uh, uh, yeah, you incorrectly said managing partner. I wish Did I was I? A, managing director. I'm managing, di right, I'm okay. managing director. Gotcha. Uh, which which means I'm running U.S. operations. Okay. And uh, I I came on board back on October first of last year. And a, a very, very good friend of mine in the cigar industry who is a consultant to this company, uh, he asked me if I'd like to become the managing director of Bahama Mama's company. And I've heard of it, but I didn't know very much about the cigar. So I told him, I said, listen, I can't take the, uh, the managing director's job without smoking your cigars because I want to smoke something that I enjoy and that I believe in. And uh, so he sent me a couple of packages and I went through all the different infused cigars in the Bahama Mama's line. There's four different infusions. And then I went through the uh, uh, La Mirada cigars, which is a non-infused Connecticut shade, true Connecticut shade wrapper, which is a fantastic cigar. Great morning smoke, great mid-afternoon smoke. And uh, that's when I came on board and uh, took on our uh, national sales director who's in Las Vegas. Uh, we have a uh, state of Florida account manager in uh, Florida. And we also have a large accounts manager who's based out of California going to all the big chains and uh, online distributors and distributors. And uh, we're looking to grow the business uh, by doing that, by hiring folks that can go around the country. And, uh, you know, with COVID, I don't have to tell you guys, uh, it's cut back on the amount of trips that cigar industry, manufacturers, reps, what have you, uh, make out in the field. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm here in Phoenix, Scottsdale, Arizona, and I was seeing three, four stores a day. But I, I've sort of cut that back to like two stores a week mm -hmm. because it's just a, it's still a dangerous uh, phenomenon. I've had uh, my first COVID vaccination, which is great. As soon as I get my second one, I'll be much more happier to, to go out to the stores. But, you know, selling cigars is really about pounding the flesh and meeting the, uh, the B&M uh, uh, retailers and uh, enjoying a smoke, one of our smokes with them and getting their feedback. So basically we started this company once again in October and it's uh, five months into it. And we've picked up uh, some nice online accounts, some nice distributors, a bunch of uh, retailers across the country. 
and uh, looking to, to spread the word uh, through these podcasts, other social media, and just people smoking our cigars and talking about it. Mm. What are some of the you, you got? You got two different blends here. You have you have an infused cigar, um, which is under it has four uh, four different blends under the Bahama Mamas label, and then you have the La Mirada Connecticut Shade. I believe it's age thirteen years or so, right off the top of my head. Um, there. Um, you, you, you all of the staff who's out on the street pushing the uh, product must realize that you probably have two different audiences for sure, right? Uh, certainly, the infused uh, revolution um, is 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 keystoned by um, uh, is keystoned by Drew Estate for sure. Uh, there, but there is a target audience for that. Um, as either introductory to cigars or want something completely different on their palate and whatnot. Uh, and then you have this conventional smoke. When I mean conventional, it's, it's not infused. The, the, La, the La Mirada. And, um, you know, so, so you're, when you're reaching out to the brick and mortars, okay, Joe, land the plane. When you're reaching out to the brick and mortars, you have two different audiences there. What are some of the um, feedback that you get on the street uh, from from the taste profile, and what could the Stogie Geeks listener expect if they were to seek out these cigars? Sure. Well, I'm smoking right now uh, the La Mirada. Yep, so am I. La Mirada is made at Tabacalera Palma, which I know you guys have heard of, and m- most of the cigar smoking world has heard of Tabacalera Palma. And they, they blended and uh, make this cigar for us. Uh, it's not an infused cigar whatsoever. It's a premium long leaf cigar made in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it features a true aged Connecticut shade wrapper. And even though I've been in the business like 27 years or so, uh, I never heard of the word true sure. aged Connecticut shade wrapper. And I asked my friend uh, John, who hired me, and uh, he said a, a true uh, Connecticut is actually a Connecticut shade wrapper grown in the state of Connecticut. Correct. Yep. And as, as you guys know, and the, your audience knows, there's Ecuadorian Connecticut, there's Nicaraguan Connecticut, there's, there's all sorts of Connecticut. They plant Connecticut seeds in the fields in Ecuador, Nicaragua, Honduras, what have you, even the Dominican. But it's not a true Connecticut shade wrapper and age means it's aged at least three years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, it's just a a delicious cigar and it's got Dominican filler and binder. And as you can see from the cigar I'm smoking, this is a Gordo and, uh, that has got a beautiful, even ash to it, a nice white or, uh, even a light gray ash. And, you know, some of the qualities I look for in my cigars is, number one, it has to have a great draw. Because if it doesn't have a draw and you're sucking on that cigar like a Hoover vacuum, you know, I'm going to put it down. I mean, I'm going to cut it again. But if I can't get a draw, I can't get taste and I can't enjoy the cigar. The the second thing is a uh, consistent, even burn, which all these cigars, including the Bahama Mamas, has. Uh, and lastly, is that uh, uh, it stays lit and it's a beautiful white or light gray ash that's strong. This thing can stay on this cigar for like two inches without any problem whatsoever. Mm. And uh, so that's the uh, La Mirada. It comes in, it comes in uh, four different sizes. Uh, it comes in a uh, Corona Gorda. Five and five eighths by 46. It comes in a Robusto Deseo, which is your traditional five by 50 Robusto. It comes in a Toro Reserva, uh, a six by 52 ring gauge, and a Gordo Magnifico, which is what I'm smoking, a six by 60, and all in boxes of 20. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're beautiful cigars. Uh, early last year, we got a 90 rating in Cigar and Spirits magazine. And that is fantastic. Now, I know it's not cigar aficionado, uh, the Bible of the cigar industry, so to speak, 
But uh, Cigar and Spirits is a hell of a magazine, and to get a 90 rating by them is quite an accomplishment, especially for such a young cigar. Mm. And uh, the other cigar brand that we make is the Bahama Mom, as hopefully you can see that. Yep. And uh, the Bahama Mom is, comes in uh, four different infusions. It comes in a Bardstown blend, which is Bardstown, Kentucky, Kentucky bourbon. Uh, it comes in a, um, uh, a Freeport rum. It comes in a Madagascar, which is like a vanilla. And it comes in a Braziliana, which is a coffee. And uh, also, uh, these four different infusions come in a, uh, a petite Corona, four and a quarter by 42, uh, a uh, Robusto, a five by 48, a uh, Bahama Mama Gordito, four and a half by 54, and the Toro, which is probably the most popular, uh, a six by 54. And we also have four packs of the petite Coronas, which sell really well. You know, a lot of people refer to that cigar as like a dog walker. Sure. You know, Actually, you in Rhode Island, uh, uh, it's it's difficult in the winter to smoke a you know an hour long cigar because you could die of hypothermia. That's true. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you smoke that uh, petite Corona. It's like a eight to 10, 12 minute cigar, and uh, it gives you all the flavors uh, of the bigger cigars. And the uh, uh, the Bahama Mamas is, is made for us at the La Aurora factory in the Dominican Republic. Also a quality, quality factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very happy to have them make our cigars. And, uh, you know, and unlike a lot of flavored cigars, especially the smaller ones, it's all premium long leaf tobacco, filler, binder, obviously wrapper. So uh, it, it's a quality cigar and both the cigars La Mirada and Bahama Mamas are extremely high quality cigars, but at affordable price points. The uh, the Bahama Mamas are like from four to six and a half dollars retail, which is quite a lot less than uh, that other brand that uh, you talked about uh, with, with infused or flavored cigars. And uh, the La Mirada uh, is like seven and a half to eight and a half dollars. And uh, the La Mirada is like a mild to medium bodied cigar. It, uh, uh, if somebody likes a stronger cigar, it's not for them. But uh, this cigar can be smoked all day long. I know, you know, I think I'm your typical cigar smoker. At least that's how I describe myself. And I describe cigars one of two ways. Either I like it or I don't like it. Mm. Sounds I, like me. <laughs> I, I'm not like a cigar sommelier where I could taste leather and cocoa and, no. wool and hay and uh, all that sort of stuff. I could tell cigars I like and cigars I don't like. And this La Mirada, I like a lot. And uh, the Bahama Mama cigar brand, just like the La Mirada, also received a 90 rating by Cigar and Spirits last year. So we're very, very happy about both of our cigars. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, before I dig a little bit and get a little geeky on the wrapper binder filler and all that stuff, uh, Drew, you have a question out there in the cigar? Yeah. No. I just I'm smoking the actual. I'm actually smoking the La Mirada Corona uh, Gorda, and I'm surprised with the Visa Polito that uh, Palato that's coming through. Um, you know, in this in in, in the cigar, and it's it, you really can transition through the uh through the uh, long fillers for sure um uh, so it's light it's definitely light um as far as um the the stick the weight stick so well, i guess my question would be um all right so in the blending process of this is this something that you're involved with uh down uh down at the uh uh plant Lower. level or yeah, Lower yeah Lower. no yeah. uh uh Quite honestly, I, you know, I was hired on in October one, and we mm -hmm. already had the cigars blended by uh, La Aurora and uh, Tobacco Lara Palma. So I did not get involved. Uh, in the future, uh, I'm looking to go down to the DR and get involved in the blending. Uh, we want to come up with a, uh, a Corojo or Sumatra uh, uh -huh. leaf 
uh, for the La Mirada line. So to give people the option of a lighter cigar or a fuller cigar or medium to full cigar. So I've never done that before, but I'm looking forward to it because I know what I like and I know what the public likes. And I'm looking forward to blending a cigar. Now, I I tell you with this La Mirada, even though it's a mild to medium, like I said, you could smoke it any time of the day. And uh, you were talking earlier, or one of you guys were talking earlier, about with newbie cigar smokers, they were almost always turned on to a flavored cigar. Mm -hmm. That's changed a lot. Do they still love the infused and the flavored cigars? Absolutely. But they also Mm -hmm. enjoy a milder cigar for their first cigar. All right? Yeah. And... uh, uh, and ladies and newbies are not only going to a smaller ring gauge cigar. You see ladies at cigar stores smoking uh, the size cigars that most guys smoke. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, uh, the cigar world is very educated. And the state of the cigar industry is such that there's never been a better choice of quality cigars in the industry. And... Uh, Everyone is saying that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I am pairing this La Mirada with a uh, 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, I'm getting butter. You getting butter? I well, I was gonna say I'm, I'm definitely getting a little creamy. I don't okay. know if that's what yeah, you're getting. Cream. No. Yeah, that's what I'm getting creamy over yeah, here. Yeah, I'm getting a little creamy. I, I mean, yeah. I'm not gonna say butter because I'd be lying. I'm not getting butter. But I'm definitely getting a little creamy. Mm-hmm. Uh, not sweet, yeah. but creamy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got a lot of natural. It's got a lot of a natural uh, uh, earth, you know, tone to it as well. Um, when I when you retro hell, it it gives you a little kick in the uh, in the retro. So. That's where I was going mm-hmm. as well, Drew. Uh, yeah. Where it's at, right? When you uh-huh. retro hail it, you can really like that Criollo '98 kicks in, and you're like, huh. yeah. It's it's got it's got it's got legs, right? As I say yeah. in the wine industry, when you swerve your little glass like this and it trickles down, it's got legs. I refer to the cigars when they got legs. Like wow, the, this cigar has something to it. It was blended very nicely. It's very enjoyable. Yeah, right. and Drew and I are actually smoking the same the same one size, yeah. so it's not surprising yeah. you're getting slightly yep. different, and and yet he and I are getting the same. So yeah. Yeah. I can see where you can go with 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 cream and whatnot, but yeah, it's it's yeah. uh it's definitely a good choice. So Brad, yeah. uh, well actually Nelson, you have a question. I have a lot, but uh, okay, go for it. Before we go, in, no, well, let, uh, we'll keep it in the context well, me, of the company right now. So Brad, what I was well, wondering me, is, you okay. know, you, you have the two, right? You have um, the Bahama Mama and the uh, La Mirada. Um, are there any new facings planned uh, for the near future? Well, yes, like I like I said a few minutes ago. Uh, uh, I'm hoping to get down to the DR and do some blending of a, a more medium to fuller bodied cigar for the La Mirada line and, and also possibly for the Bahama Mamas line. And uh, yeah. because what we want to do is we want to give everyone uh, a choice. Do they like mild? Do they like medium? Do they like full bodied? Uh, mm-hmm. It's said and come up also with some uh, unique uh, sizes. You know, it's uh, it's like a kid in a candy store. You can you can make anything, you know, these days. And uh, it's a matter of blending and uh, creating popular sizes, not just sizes that I like, but sizes that are popular amongst the the public. Are you looking at um, I know more and more folks are moving from, you know, like I think we all agree people start with the, the mild or mild to medium. Right. But after a while, you start to migrate to the Maduro side and, and the Fuller side. Um, are you guys considering going that route Yeah, well, to stronger? Uh, well, we're looking at going at a Fuller-bodied cigar. I'm not sure if it's necessarily Maduro because more than half the cigar population likes a milder to medium-bodied cigar. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the heavy-duty cigar enthusiasts – they're smoking fuller bodied cigars. Yeah. So when you get a little older and you smoke a lot of cigars, you don't really uh, care for the strength of a Maduro, even though, you know, it's sweet. 
uh, you might not care for it. But it's a way to blend it with the filler, the binder, and the wrapper. Uh, you know, our La Mirada, even though it's mild, it's mild with taste. So uh, I remember when I first got started smoking cigars, my dad took me down to the original Nat Sherman store in, uh, in Manhattan. Mm, uh, yeah. Just, God, 40 Very years cool. ago. And he bought me Macanudos, a Macanudo Portofino, because mm. it was a mild cigar. But when I smoke that Macanudo Portofino now, it's like smoking paper. Now, <laughs> obviously, Macanudo is probably one of the top brands in the world. But, you know, uh, it's a great cigar to start on, but then to graduate from that. And a yep. graduation from that, or even for a Nouveau smoker, this La Mirada is an excellent choice. Mm. Absolutely. Drew, question before we pivot potentially on subject? Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, with, with as, as in regards to the flavor cigars, I I actually got into the uh, the uh, Bahama Mama uh Bardstown uh, blend, and uh, you know I, I I'm a long way from smoking a flavored cigar, but that that cigar there just uh, my experience with that was more uh, very light, very uh, uh, flavored tip or flavored. Uh, I'm I'm assuming the tip is flavored, something's flavored, but the uh, the smoke content that was uh, uh, big. But not overwhelming. So, uh, kudos to you on that. Um, a little oily for me, but at at the same point, uh, I think it's something that you know people that do smoke flavored cigars can definitely uh, hop into, especially with your four pack. Uh, I think you have a sampler four pack. Is that right, Brad? Right, right. Is that, right. That's and what you, you said to it. Yeah. Right, and the way that I describe the uh, our infused cigars is they have a very sweet tip much like uh, the Baccarat cigars, which all of us have smoked. And, and the infusion, the flavor on the infusions are very subtle, very subtle. Mm -hmm. Now, more, some people can really taste the bourbon or the rum or the Madagascar or the coffee, but it's wow. very subtle. And also, when you're smoking that any one of those infused cigars in a cigar lounge with 5, 10, 20 people, you do not get the overpowering flavor aroma like yeah. you do with uh, quite a lot of the flavored cigars on the market today. So therefore, you know, it's not going to have that overpowering flavor where true cigar smokers don't appreciate that uh, aroma <laughs> and uh, might true. walk away. Hmm. I did, or to you know, get out. I did, I, I did notice that, Brad, um, now that you bring that up, when, when Joe handed me um, some of the Bahama Mamas, I didn't get, you know, I, it wouldn't be overwhelming because it's not lit yet, but I didn't really get that even when I lit it right away. I didn't get this overwhelming smell, like you're saying, the aromatic infusion didn't really yeah. come out like some other uh, brands. So that that's a great point. I, I, I noticed it, but I didn't really make note of it until you just brought it up. So that's that's a great point. Right. A, a lot of the compliments, quite frankly, that we've been getting on the Bahama Mamas infused cigars is that it's not overpowering. Yeah. Yeah. They appreciate the flavor or the aroma being very subtle. You can still taste it, but it's subtle. And most people, hell, everybody that I've talked to appreciates it. Cool. Super cool. Take us through your resume and uh, how you've... Um You've gotten into the business. You've done. Uh, I can't wait till the, we talk about your AM uh, cigar radio show you had. <laughs> but anyway, oh, yeah. but take us through. But take us through your resume, and 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 we'll well, we'll, we'll my, go from my there. resume is ever since uh, graduating uh, school, I've been in my own businesses with uh, uh, sports uh, sports marketing company, television production company. Uh, and then my youngest brother in Miami Beach back in the mid-90s created a cigar event to, uh, I don't want to say compete against the Big Smoke, but he and his uh, lawyer friend went to a Big Smoke in Miami Beach. And this is back in the day when the Big Smoke held their events in a dozen cities across the country when you could smoke indoors. 
And uh, that event in Miami Beach was at the old Playboy Hotel. Mm. I don't know if you, you guys are too young to remember that. Heard of it. Heard uh, stories. Yeah. They, they went to that event, and they didn't think it was social enough. And both my brother and his lawyer friend were single at the time, and they couldn't get uh, any dates from yeah. that event. So uh, they created their own event in the mid-90s uh, called the Cigar Schmooze. And they had anywhere from 1,500 people to 3,000 people. Wow. They had it from South, uh, South Beach up to Atlanta and in different cities across, uh, uh, across Florida, Orlando, Tampa, etc. cetera. And uh, I wasn't doing anything for a couple of years in the mid-90s. I sold my, my sports marketing and TV production business. And uh, I was living out here in uh, Scottsdale. And my brother said, why don't you do one of these events in Phoenix? And uh, you're a marketing uh, pro and you, you're an event pro and check it out. So I did it and we held it. And once again, back in the day when you could smoke indoors before all these anti-smoking laws. Oh, I miss those days. Yeah, I always I, talk about them on the show. <laughs> oh, I, mean, I miss I, those days. <laughs> do you guys remember going to like a Morton Steakhouse yep. and having dinner? We at table in the restaurant with yep. your cigars yep. we uh i used to own a cigar shop in providence rhode island and um uh hemingways was one of our clients that we you know we filled their their humidor and all that stuff and i remember closing the shop probably early on some nights ah, it's dead tonight we're out of here it's a rainy friday we're, 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 we're bouncing and we would go to hemingways and have seafood and chill and just sit there for hours smoking cigars and you know we start with some oysters and then see me it's weird right because when you go with me i'm not uh like i don't like cigar dinners i go to them but my characteristics are i don't like to smoke and eat never did been smoking cigars for 26 years or so right and it's like it's like i don't like to smoke and eat right so i would go have my oysters then i would smoke like a robusto uh then i would jump into you know the, the 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 whatever or i would just be done at the oysters and just order a freaking tower and house that tower myself and just you know and do it up and yeah um but i miss those days going into yeah. a place and 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 chilling and smoking and definitely miss those days i have tons of stories where i was at like concerts uh you know i i went to berkeley college of music so um you know uh, e uh We've gone to a lot of live shows, and I've met, like, crazy people just having a cigar in my hand, you know? I remember going to New York Yankee games, because I grew up in New York City. Yep. In, uh, oh, I guess the 70s, and my father was smoking a cigar sitting in his box seat. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yep. You know, Different those times. Were the days when, those are the days when men were men. And those are the days when you got, like, freaking super Big sandwiches for like freaking yeah. three dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. those were the good old days. But yeah. uh, so my brother encouraged me to bring his cigar schmooze to Phoenix, <laughs> and I held it in May of 1997 at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Nice. <laughs> their uh, grand ballroom, which was 7,500 square feet. Classy. At the time, they were launching their cigar lounge which was members and open to the public in their lobby bar. So they thought the gr a great way to introduce the Ritz Carlton Cigar Lounge was to host this huge event at the Ritz in their ballroom. So I went out to, uh, it was either Young's Market or Southern Wine and Spirits, you know, a liquor distributor. And yeah. we got all the different bourbon, scotch, tequila companies to pour uh, drinks. And then we had like 20 or so manufacturers. Uh, we had live music. Uh, we had dancing. We had a men's and ladies fashion show. Uh, it was just fantastic. And that first event, we had 1,300 people. Mm. And we turned away over 500 people at the door because we couldn't fit them in. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, I, I held like a half a dozen events throughout Arizona and Southern California. And, uh, you know, when they were opening the Ritz Carlton Cigar Lounge, uh, the general manager comes to me and says, Brad, do you know anyone that could supply us with cigars? 
And I said, let me get back to you. And uh, I told this to a few buddies of mine here. And they said, Brad, are you a moron? Yeah, this start your own company and supply them. Business. <laughs> right? Good, because I, I didn't want to interrupt you, and I'm sorry I did. I would have been like, hold on, give me 38 seconds to establish an LLC. I will supply you know, them uh, for you. I'm not, I'm, I'm not that smart. Come on, man. Smart. Yeah, so, so anyway, I finally went back to them and said, look, if you give me a month or so, I'll get my tobacco license. And I'll supply you with all the cigars you want. And the Ritz Carlton was my first on premise, as we call it, yep. count. Yeah. And from there, I started an on premise distribution company that we were licensed in 27 states. Yep. We had over 50, we had 57, I think, casinos across the United States, over 20 in Vegas. Nice. Uh, yeah. I opened the Bellagio Casino Hotel in November of 1998. And we had 26 humidors throughout the property. Mm -hmm. From that, I got the win. I got Paris, Paris, Mandalay Bay, et cetera. We were in Biloxi, Mississippi. We were in New Orleans. We, we were all over. I had a few hundred golf courses. Uh, my biggest golf course client was Pebble Beach Company. Oh, yeah. I had all four of their courses and all three of their resorts as the exclusive cigar provider from 2001 through 2010. Uh, I would uh, go up there every six weeks or so because one business was good, but I enjoyed playing the Pebble Beach golf links. Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and that yes. was a lot of fun. And, you know, from, from that one property in the Monterey Peninsula, I had almost eight, 18 properties, you know, hotels and golf courses. Mm. And, the, it spread the chain accounts and uh, did real, real well. Oh, yeah. You got to remember uh, timeline. And then in like 2008, 2009, that business went to hell when the recession hit. Yep. And uh, then all of a sudden, instead of dealing with the food and beverage directors at these properties, you had to deal with the, uh, uh, the purchasing, the buyers. Yep. And uh, the buyers, they only cared about getting the same product for the cheapest price yeah. possible, didn't give a hoot about service. Yep. Mm. So a lot of these companies, uh, I went way down in my pricing, uh, but then they were asking for the same level of service as I did before. I mean, I would go to Las Vegas two to three times a month just to service all these accounts because it was a lot of accounts and a lot of humidors. And uh, I just couldn't do it anymore. So in like, you know, 2008, 2009, I would call the Bellagio. I call Pebble Beach Company and I tell them, look, guys, I can't do I can't afford to do business with you. Yep. And they were shocked. They said nobody stops doing business with us. Well, that's the way it goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the other thing was, is instead of me billing them at net 30 days, they would want 60, 90, 120 day terms. Well, that's because you're the bank at that billion point. dollar yeah. properties. And I'm just, you know. Little Joe Schmo. Yeah, and the problem is, like, uh, pff, you brought up so much in that in that breath, right? The purchase agent, you know, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing, right? That's a Xerox cliche. I can't take credit for that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and then also, like, you know, they 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 want to carry them. They want you to carry the note for ninety days because then they're they're always ninety days in the rear. And I've actually had a couple of accounts like that in my advertising agency when I was doing television and radio. And I just send them letters and say, I just can't, I just can't afford to do business with you. It's that simple, right? You know, you know, you you, you have to have uh, uh, big cojones, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, to tell a Bellagio or a Pebble Beach or a Win Las Vegas mm -hmm. that can't afford to do business with them. And, you know, they would go out to the uh, local uh, cigar retailer and tell the retailer what they want to pay. And the retailer was more than happy to do business just because they had the bragging rights. Yeah. But I've been mm. on premise business for like a dozen years. I didn't need bragging rights anymore. I'm trying to make a living Yep. and, and grow the company. Right on. And so my next foray, because I love the cigar industry, uh, I mean, the first before it was PCA, it was IPCPR, and before that, it was RTDA. Yep. So my first RTDA was uh, 1995 in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> uh, and that's when I got uh, into the cigar business. 
And uh, when I closed my on-premise business, I opened up a, a cigar retail lounge here in, uh, in Scottsdale. And that yeah. lasted for about eight and a half years. The last, uh, oh, excuse me, the first five, six years were excellent. And I, I built the type of cigar store and smoking lounge that I would want to go to. Mm-hmm. Because again, I consider myself the typical cigar smoker. And it was rectangular in shape. And I had a, 50, a 40 foot wall, excuse me, with seven 52 inch TV monitors. So it's like going to a sports book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then opposite that, I built a glass cabinet humidor that was about 50 feet in length. Then we had about 400 facings of different cigars. And uh, we had seating in there for about 30 people. We did tons of events. Uh, we had all, when it was the NFL time, we had direct TV. So we had the NFL package. So we had guys coming in there, spending the day. We would barbecue, hot dogs, burgers, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was a real social place. Met so many friends through that business and uh, through that retail lounge. Uh, but then the last two, three years out here, uh, a lot of cigar stores were opening up bars. Yep. Uh, some just beer and wine, but most of them full liquor. And as, as a cigar consumer, I love my single malt scotches. And I would rather go to a place where I can smoke and order my cocktail. So yeah. I couldn't blame a lot of my members and a lot of my regulars from going there. And I basically funded that business for about the last two years until my wife finally said, uh, enough is enough. Yeah. And I agreed with her. <laughs> And, uh, you know, got out of that business. I was very sorry to get out of it. I mean, I probably work 70 to 80 hours a week. uh, And going to the shop every day was so much fun. And, uh, you know, sitting there smoking cigars, talking with the guys, meeting reps and manufacturers. Every manufacturer came in and out of my cigar shop for those eight and a half years. And that's also when I created, as you were alluding to, uh, my AM radio show. And uh, I created it. It was called The Best Damn Cigar Show. I don't know <laughs> if you recall The Best Damn uh, Sports Show on Fox TV. Yes, I remember. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, I took my hint from that. Never got sued, thankfully, from Fox Sports. And uh, <laughs> we had that show live from my uh, lounge every Sunday from uh, noon to one. Mm, and yeah. uh, it was on the, uh, the business news radio station, which was the biggest AM station yep. in the Valley of the Sun. So we had a reach of four or five million people. I, I'm not going to tell you four or five million people listen, but, you know, we had a good listenership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, uh, I had other retailers on my show and retailers that I knew that were friends of mine. Brad, why do you want us on your show talking about our store? Well, I believe that if we spread the word about cigars, that when you're in a different section of town, you're going to go to that cigar store. And when you're in my section of town, you're going to go to my cigar store. So that worked really well. Yeah, it's really a community. I had Glenn Loop from uh, the XCRA director on yeah. two or three times. I had all these manufacturers on. And, uh, you know, this is before Zooms, Zoom calls. Mm. So I had them on just the audio. and uh, But it worked really well. And obviously, when I closed down my cigar store, we uh, went off the air. Yep. And uh, now I'm doing these podcasts, which are fantastic. I mean... I love being on these podcasts talking about our Bahama Mama cigars, but uh, also I'm on a, on a couple of these like uh, virtual herfs, if you will. So, yeah. guys, people are afraid sometimes of going to a cigar lounge with 10, 15 other people because of COVID. And, uh, but you go to this Zoom lounge and it's like going to the cigar store. And yep. it, it's just wonderful. Yeah, Nelson's all into that scene. Yeah, I like the virtual herfs. So I'm a big fan of those. You know, and I think I met I think I met you gentlemen on the Boutique Cigar Association Social Club on Friday night. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's fantastic. And we're members of the Boutique Cigar Association. So I believe in that. Uh, I remember when I was a retailer, I would carry a lot of boutiques. Of course, I carried, you know, all the name brands from General and Altadis and Fuente and Padron and, you know, everybody in between. But I always carried boutiques. Mm-hmm. I remember, uh, you know, the uh, boutique manufacturers would call on me, but more than likely, I would call them. Say, I, I heard of your cigars. I've smoked your cigars. I want to carry them. Send me the information. Huh. And, yeah. and you yep. know, tried them for like two, three months. And if they didn't move, okay, we went on and created shelf space for somebody else. Yep. But, uh, you know, people love choices amongst their cigars. I mean, like everyone else, I have my regulars that I like to go to, but I like to try something new. And, uh, you know, people would come into my retail cigar store and say, hey, Brett, what do you have that's new? First question people would ask. Of course. And and to be yeah. honest with you, that is uh, still probably the most asked question when we interview retailers here, for sure. You brought up, you brought up so many, so, so many fascinating points that could extend to a second interview and getting into that. I mean, you know, you, you first of all, in regards to the, I'll go backwards and, and start with what you last said and move back for those still geese listeners who are just listening and not watching. And, you know, it, it's like, you know, in, in Brad's day, and it's funny how we have some similar timelines, right, of owning a shop and whatnot. The boutiques were cheaper than the classic facings. And now the boutiques, eh, a couple dollars more in some cases. I, yep. I know with yours, Brad, it's not. But, you know, it, it's like it's different. And people would buy their regular classic stuff, but they would always experiment more. And you got to remember. And then it's like, well, it's kind of like the same now. And it is, but it isn't because there's a mystique about a boutique then because you didn't have the social media aspect of being in that boutique owner's living room, so to speak, especially yeah. now right. with, with COVID. So all the mystery, all the mystery is gone with, with the internet, yeah. right? I, I think it's that, but I also think it's something that, that Brad actually hit on earlier, which I think, and you know, Brad being 25 years or so in, in the industry, I, I, I'd like to see your thoughts on this, but I think you said it earlier, the cigar smoker today is more educated than they were 15 years ago. The, uh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So I think they're, because of that education, they're more likely to try. Because I think you go back to the early 90s, people smoked what they smoked, and they probably didn't really go too far from that wheelhouse. Whereas today, to Joe's point, you know, because of social media, because they're more educated, they're willing to try other things. Well, it's like that across sectors, right? I don't want to just say, okay, the cigar industry. Cigar, right, 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 right. Look at buying a car. You no longer have to go to the dealership. They and bring now, it to you. And now even local dealerships here in the Northeast, and I'm sure they're doing it in your neck of the woods, Drew, and Brad mm-hmm. as well. Oh, you want to do a test drive? We'll show up to your place. Like, right. they're going to show up to your, like, so basically, if, if, you know, you pass the credit and all that stuff, you'll show up to my place of employment and our house, you know. If I was in the market for a car, I'd be like, yeah, can you meet me at the weenie joint? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'll buy a dinner and freaking a uh, uh, lunch and, and let's have some hot, hot, hot wieners and really drive this thing. You know what I mean? Remind me not to go to dinner with Joe. You just get wieners. What well, the hell? Not dinner, you know what I mean? Freaking whatever, dude. It's a yeah. Scooby snack. Yeah, the, bo- uh, the boutique business, like you're saying, crosses many industries. Yes. The beverage industry. Excuse me. All the craft beers, all the small batch bourbons and yep. limited whiskeys uh you know cigars are the same way when i got started in the cigar industry there were two uh major players which are st- which is still the case today yep <laughs> you have a cigar and you have out this and you have all their brands but when i got started uh padron and fuente they were boutique brands <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah. Now today, Fuente manufactures, what is it? I think like 40 million cigars a year. You can't exactly mm-hmm. call them a boutique. And the Boutique Cigar Association has defined boutique brands as under 1 million sticks a year that they manufacture. 
And, uh, you know, th- those are the folks that, like ourselves, that are really trying to get the word out and social media uh, and your podcasts and all these other podcasts are, are a great way to get that, uh, uh, that name out there. Mm-hmm. What I've always liked about the boutiques is they've pushed the envelopes for creativity. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, creativity, flavor profile, branding, marketing, however you want to categorize them, right? And it's always been a fascination. And if you don't believe me, take out the the premium cigar industry. Well, what's the latest car that's going to come out? What's the latest uh, right. gaming system that's going to come out? What's the latest fashion or whatever? Right. Game changes. And, and, and then game changes, and, and it pushes... It pushes the envelopes, but at the end of the day, it's like some businesses, when their boutiques go overboard with some of their marketing and camouflage some of the taste of the stick, and then some of them have like super cool profile, if you will, flavor profile, and people like go out and like treasure hunt these things. You know what I mean? And yeah. and 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 then you have backup, and then you have you know uh, uh, su- su- supply chain issues and all of that stuff. Uh, you know because you know let's face it, them you know your your Bahama Mamas are rolled in the Lauderdale factory, sure, but they're gonna roll Lauderdale. First, of course, <laughs> you know what right, I mean, yeah. and, and, and so you know it just it is what it is, right? So you know it's just it's just kind of it's kind of interesting, right? And 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 it's just fascinating, and the dynamics of how it changed and how technology has now come to this industry. You know, Brad shop, Brad's former shop was like my former shop. You had well, we only had one television, and like we listened to vinyl. They rolled, um, made pipe uh, blends as well because pipe tobacco was pretty popular as well. We've had old timers who would come in and do blends, and the guy's name was Jamie, so he would have Jamie's blend. By the way, I still have some from from, from my <laughs> old shop. And this other guy was Tim, and we'd have Timmy's blend, and they would roll, and they would buy the yeah. products, do that, and their deal with us was so they can their pipe club can come down and roll them, and they would just fill a jar for us. And they can keep the rest because we had all the tools and whatnot. It was a resource place. No, I mean, we had cable, but like no like loungy aspect. Right. And that's what I miss of the industry. It was a tobacco shop. And someone like me who's in that transition, right? I'm old enough and, uh, you know, to keep smoking, but I have to go through that metamorphosis of now it's a lounge. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and then you got some lounges that are bars as well, like, you know, Casa Fuente and Caesar's Palace, and you're like, shit, it, they held on to that old school flavor, even though they've metamorphosized into a bar where you can smoke. And say, that, you know, in the pre, pre-COVID days when we would go there, you know, 40, maybe 30% of everyone there is only consuming cigars. The rest of the bar, but you know you're in a Casa Fuente. So... That's where it's like you have to make a decision, right? In business, you're going to go lounge and, oh, by the way, you can smoke in it because it's smoking laws. Or are you going to be a tobacconist resource? And Brad Shop and Oshos were resources. Right, right, right exactly. And people and, don't want them anymore, they, Brad, which is why we got out of the business. <laughs> it's, why, it's why we got out right. of the business. Because if you opened up another one and just stayed true to your original model, and if I opened up another one and stayed true to my original model, Right, the only way yeah. we're gonna survive is to go online, get an internet sensation like like you, Nelson, and, <laughs> and pump that stuff out. No, seriously, right. it's the only way you're gonna it survive is. now. It's the, it's the business model. It's like it is so, what it is. And I, I think here in Phoenix we have the highest concentration per capita of cigar stores. I'm not talking head shops. I'm talking legitimate cigar stores. We have at least sixty, and uh, I think Atlanta is number two in the country. Yep. But, Way, um, you know, uh, where I was located, there were at least four or five cigar stores within a three, four mile period. Yep. And everybody would always ask me about my competition. And I'd always say, I can only worry about the four walls that I have. Yep. Yep. That's it. I got, I got and, to sustain uh, these four walls. 
Yeah. And I had to make a decision back in 08 or so about becoming a bar. And I did not want to become a bar. Nope. I, I just didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want the cost involved. Uh, I wanted to run a cigar lounge. And it was just for the cigar smoking. And we had coffee and we had soft drinks. Every now and then a guy would bring in a bottle of booze, which, you know, we looked the other way. Yep. But uh, nobody was bartending. Nobody was making cocktails. And uh, that seems to be the trend today is you have to have a bar to supplement your cigar business. Right. Right. Yeah. That's what we did down at my lounge over at uh, Proceed Cigar and now Coffee Bar. We actually went the coffee route. We bought some very expensive, nice equipment from Nespresso uh, on the commercial side. And so, you know, we've expanded ours. And there'll be some photos up here. Probably in the next few episodes, we'll get some things together for Prestige uh, Tobacco and uh, Coffee Bar. But we went the coffee bar route over there with uh, Nomi. And, uh, you know, we expanded the store. It's rectangular, about comfortable leather chairs, monitors. We got about two, four, six, eight, ten monitors now. And a big, giant 80-inch 80, 80 uh, in the in the in the uh, members lounge, but yeah, it's you know he had we had he you know he was like, what do I do? Do I go ahead and get the liquor license and pay the ten grand and go through all the headaches of that, or do I just do something else that's you know here in Texas that a lot of people are looking for good coffee uh, bars or lounges or, or whatnot, and so you know we it, it's two separate rooms, but yet it's it it fits the model here correctly and and therefore that's that's what nomi decided to do is go ahead and go with the coffee bar um uh, but yeah i mean that's what you have to do i mean to sustain that uh and also you know a lot of the clients you know that's that's what they were you know really um we asked our clients and they were like yeah coffee bar you know because we can bring her you know you can do a byob here in texas um and of course like you said no one's bartending you know people bring their own special scotches and whatnot and and you know we charge a you know a, 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 kind of like a corkage fee but uh but uh it, it suffices with what the clients need and what they want at this time well I, i'll give you two follow-ups with uh, the bar business first mm. of all here in arizona uh, a full liquor license is over a hundred thousand dollars. Oh yeah. Shit. Mm. And then to buy booze from the distributors, it's COD. It yeah. doesn't matter if you're the biggest liquor chain or the biggest uh, grocery chain, it's COD. Yeah. Yep. So that's probably about a two hundred thousand dollar cash commitment yep. right yeah. off the bat yep. without even building the bar and building the lounge. The second right. thing is Wives and girlfriends of the uh, primarily, you know, male clientele we had when they would yeah. come down to the Scottsdale Cigar Club and we were just smoking cigars and watching sports or the Sopranos or whatever it was. The wives and girlfriends were not worried about where their husbands were because <laughs> they were like at a bar. Right. With, you know, beautiful women uh, looking for guys, etc. I mean, did we have women <laughs> who were members and customers? Yeah, absolutely. But those women came there because they love cigars. Right. Yeah. You know, it was a different era. Different. Today is different than you know the uh, the mid uh, mid nineties, let's say, when the cigar boom occurred. Mm -hmm. Everyone was smoking cigars because it was cool. It was hip. You know, it was, it was trendy. Now people are smoking cigars because they enjoy cigars. Yeah. You know, that's a wonderful thing. I love that. I also think to add to that, I think people look at this La Mirada that I'm smoking. Yeah. I mean, th this is it's just burning perfectly. I haven't relit this cigar once. I also think that the, there's a little bit of crossover there because of the sm anti smoking laws that we talked about previously in the beginning of the show of going to a steakhouse or going to a restaurant smoking. They're just bars. Some of them are just bars that you can smoke in. Like it just, yeah. it's well, just, I think most you know. of them are bars that you could smoke in because th those retailers, they are making the majority of their business of the revenue from liquor sales. Oh, yeah. No question. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to drink two to three drinks for every cigar you smoke. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely have that. I mean, right here in Rhode Island, we have that. And I actually, I say that to folks all the time. People will, I'm from Massachusetts. People from Massachusetts will say to me, hey, what do you recommend? for a lounge in Rhode Island because there's there's a good good chunk of them. What is it, forty something and change? One. 
41. And I'll say, well, what do you like? Are you looking for a bar that allows you to smoke cigars? Or are you looking for a cigar lounge? Because to your point, there are differences. And that exists right right here in our state as well. Mm. Absolutely. So before we wrap up your yes, interview, the AM radio station, is that fun or what? Were, were people allowed to call in and stuff like that? No, you know, I, I experimented with the call-ins because we were live. Yep had like a 10 second delay because you know you get some of these bananas out there that would, <laughs> you know try to pick your brain thank god for google you know about these different cigar blends and what's the wrapper and the filler and uh what uh what plot in uh the nicaragua that this yeah, cigar, what valley, <laughs> what valley? You know, they would just have stupid stuff so i figured i, I better control it and being on a uh uh, an AM radio station that's regulated by the federal government is so different than a podcast. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you, you couldn't curse, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. And, and we were regulated. I mean, we had, you know, about every 10, 12 minutes, we had another two minute commercial break. Yep. And, yeah. you know, the timing had to be impeccable on something like that. Yeah. And, my, my background is producing live sports events for ESPN and Fox. I produced mm -hmm. them. And, you know, you had the, the cable and uh, uh, the satellite feeds and you had the time you were on there. And then, you know, I had to communicate or one of my, uh, my guys in the trucks had to communicate with Bristol, Connecticut, at ESPN's headquarters on running the commercials during the segments. And uh, these podcasts are fantastic. And they're not going away. They're just going to get bigger and bigger. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And 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 it's 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 a good outlet, you know, uh, for sure. And what I like about them is like we're we're all different, right? Right. It's not right. you know, and and just just like just like boutique cigars, consumers will listen to what they want to listen to and hear the content that they want to listen to, and uh, yeah, it's um. Right. It is definitely and, here to stay for sure. And, and if you allow me to, uh, before closing out, I want to mention if people want to learn more about Bahama Mama's cigars. Yeah, go for it. Go to our website, which is Bahama Mama's, you know, with a plural, cigar singular dot com. So Bahama Mama's cigar dot com. If they want to get in touch with me, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. It's just my first name, Brad, B R A D. At BahamaMamasCigar.com. There you go. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Nelson, you have a question? Uh, Brad, I, I, my question is, what haven't you done? So I, I, in addition to everything you just said, did, did I see in a, in a previous interview you're also an attorney? Uh, I, I was an attorney. I graduated law school in 83. And Jesus. Uh, immediately <laughs> out of law school, uh, a, a friend of mine and I started you know, 40 years ago and 150 pounds ago, I was a teaching tennis <laughs> professional. So we started a, a tennis <laughs> management company that managed uh, tennis courts for resorts, municipalities, and private clubs. And uh, within three years, we had 23 properties across the country. And uh, I remember uh, the summer of uh, 83 and 84, I was director of tennis even though I was really involved in the management of the company, but the board of directors at Kenny Bunkport Racquet Club in uh, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, mm -hmm. me full time, well, not full time, during the summer to be their tennis pro. And that's when uh, Vice President George Bush was a member of the club. And uh, I was his doubles partner for the whole summer of 83. And <laughs> I had so much fun with him awesome. and this. And the Secret Service. I went up to his home. Wow! Couple times and have dinner with Barbara and the kids and the the next uh, Bush president, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So you know, yeah. did quite a few things. So you're not really a retailer, or a wholesaler, or a tennis guy, or attorney. You're a get it get shit done guy. Yeah, I'm. Uh, what do you call it? An entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. There you go. A serial well, entrepreneur. You know, I'm a guy that does things that I'm passionate about. Yep, I'm the same way. I'm uh, I've way. been offered other positions, and uh, it doesn't do anything for me. All right. Uh, know, I do something that I enjoy. You can say yes, no, or no comment. Was he good at tennis? 
<laughs> George Bush good? Was the vice president good at tennis? Yes, sir. Yeah. He was great. <laughs> All right, just ask it. <laughs> good he, question. He was great. I mean, we, we played doubles probably 60 times that summer. Mm. We lost once. Nice. Yeah. I think part of that is because the other members didn't want to beat the vice president. <laughs> <laughs> nah. but, uh, we made it. We made a good team. So that that was a lot of fun, and uh, you know I post that picture every now and then of me yeah. with the vice president playing tennis, and people go, "Who the hell is that? Is that the president of the United States?" I go, "No, no, he was just the vice president." Right. <laughs> How was the Secret Service? We uh, need to see, see some ID. I, I, we need to see I some ID. Secret, <laughs> I had to have Secret Service clearance, obviously. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, when we played tennis, it was like a, a two court, uh, two courts within a fenced area. Then there was another six or eight courts, and always the uh, the other court was empty when we played. Sure. It was always at least 20, 25 Secret Service agents. Yeah, uh, surrounding yeah. the court. And keep in mind, this is Kenny Buckport, Maine, in the summer. So those right, secret yeah. surgeons agents are sweating in their suits. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about sweating because I, I think I sweated one time the whole summer. Oh, really? <laughs> Seventy-five. Oh, it was beautiful. Wow. It was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, Kenny Buckport. By the way, uh, for you Story Geeks listeners, that's a fun town. Mm. It's a great steakhouse there. I can't remember Kenny the name Bunkport, of it. Buckport, Maine, in the winter. Is like you can go and stroll, and you know you gotta wear, you gotta dress up like your freaking Eskimo. I get it, but like it is such a super cool town. I actually looked for a property out there. Yeah, yeah. when I was there in the uh, early to mid '80s, uh, they had one street light mm -hmm. in the whole town. In the winter time, that street light was turned off. People never locked their their front doors. And they, the phone numbers were just the last four numbers. Yeah. In the yeah. days when you had to remember phone numbers. Holy before. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's like I told my uh, my wife, because we were engaged at the time, I told her that I've never worked harder in my life, but had more fun. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it was a great experience. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, offline, in a couple of weeks, Brad, you and I should uh, connect via a zoom meeting would love to um put a show together for april may time frame just to, just to give you a thing and talk about like the different pivot points in the industry i think you'd be a good resource for that i'm i'm actually putting together a, f a forum of either future people or um past guests to have that and talk about like okay like you know i was active in this industry in the 90s and this was a pivot point and this and that and just kind of dissect the industry uh because it's never been done before uh you know and i think that it it'll it'll help the stogie geeks listeners when we meet all different guests and we always talk about the glory days the glory days the glory days they can really understand from a global perspective so um Nelson, please keep me to task on that over next week. Yes, and then um, you know uh, I'm gonna get. I'll, I'll send you a link, Brad. You can connect to me on the calendar via Zoom. I want to put that together on a day. I'd love to get you and one other guest and talk I, about I that. Would I would love to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah because lots of, lots of memories, yeah. lots of stories. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah. And and this actually comes from a uh, Stogie Geeks listener. This topic comes from a Stogie Geeks listener. I emailed him yesterday. Hold on. His name is Todd. Uh, and he was he was talking about like when I always like because I always give a visual before I ask the question and whatnot. And uh, he he was saying how we should do something of that. Like a to, forum. To kind of like a round table. Yeah, yeah, a round table of like the chronological discussion. of the chronological he says because he, he says like when you're on the show like you have so many stories. And I'm like, dude, like I, I've been around it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I've been around it and, and there were glory days and it's crazy. And someone like Brad, you know, I I met him today on the show, as we know how the show format goes, right? right. I met him today on the show. Nelson and Drew viewed all your previous interviews. I did not. 
And then, you know, and Nelson <laughs> comes in. He was on this interview, said this. I said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I'm going to meet him on the show. That's it. And, yeah. and, 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 that, and that, that's just the way that I do it, right? Um, because I, I think that the conversation comes out more dynamically that way, right? Because, you know, you, you, like you would tell us, like the president, like or the, or, the, or the vice president, like that, we would never even hear something like that. You know what I mean? So it's, it's super cool. But I think having a forum about those pivot points, because I think it's going to bring up a lot of super cool elements for the retailers that, that might have, I don't want to say lost their way, but have changed or the retailers that are in the process of oh my god i really need to change my business what the heck do i do next so it's like yeah. uh, not to be a name drop or anything oh go for it i smoked cigars t on two occasions with the governor of california arnold schwarzenegger yeah oh yeah his, his tent in sacramento yeah nice. a tent outside the uh capital over yeah there. yeah a, yeah. a, a good go friend of tent. mine from yeah. monterey was the real estate commissioner for California on uh, Schwarzenegger's cabinet. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, he invited me up to smoke cigars with him and uh, a couple times, and it, it was just fun. And he was just like a regular guy, and we were just smoking cigars and talking yep. uh, a number of topics. Yep. yep. Number of topics. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Brad, uh, Nelson's going to keep me to task. That will prompt an email for me. We'll get that going. I'm thinking April, May you know depending on show schedule and all that stuff but uh anything any last comments you want to bring about the bahama mamas no i mean uh once again i'm just proud to be the managing director of this company and uh we're looking to get it into uh retail stores across the country uh online retailers distributors chain accounts wherever we can mm. and if anyone would like to uh email me as a as a member of the industry and want our cigars or as a uh, individual consumer and want to talk cigars or learn more about our cigars, you know, my email is brad at bahamamamascigar.com and our website is bahamamamascigar.com. And for you Stogie Geeks listeners who are listening, you can go to stogiegeeks.com forward slash 355, which is the episode number, and the show notes will be in there and link to Brad's website. Brad, I want to thank you for appearing on Stogie Geeks. Thank it's you, been Brad. a privilege and an honor to hear your story. Stogie Geeks. Thank you so much. Stogie Geeks, when we come back, Sticks of the Week. Nelson's got some news. I'm sure Drew's got some commentary. It's going to be awesome. Right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back.